Um, it is great to be here this morning. The church looks so beautiful for Christmas and to hear the children singing these Christmas songs and for us to get to sing these Christmas songs. It'd be great to be together tonight for that, for just kind of for a Christmas party with all of us together for fellowship. And um, uh, starting next week, uh, on the next three weeks, December 10, 17, and 24, I'm going to give just uh, special Christmas gospel messages. And uh, we have those cards for you to invite folks to come in December. And uh, that'll begin next week. This morning, we're going to be in Hebrews 5. We're going to finish Hebrews chapter 5 today. And then we'll be out of Hebrews for December and the beginning of January, then when we get back into Hebrews, we'll start Hebrews chapter 6, Lord willing, in, uh, in uh, the third week of January in uh, 2018. So for our time in the Word this morning, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 5. And as we prepare to look at God's Word together, let's pray. Great God and Savior, as the Word of Christ is taught, in this moment, may the people of Christ be helped. As the word of Christ is opened here in this place, in this hour, may the hearts of Christ's people also be opened by Christ himself. As the word of Christ is preached in this moment, may it produce Christ-likeness in us. As Christ's word is explained, may Christ himself be exalted. Amen. As you listen to this morning's Bible teaching, here's what I want you to listen for. As you listen to this morning's Bible teaching, know this. This morning's Bible teaching is about listening to Bible teaching. As you listen to the Bible teaching in this hour... Be aware of this. It's right down the middle. The Bible teaching this hour is about how you can be helped by or not helped by the Bible teaching that you hear, whatever other hour you hear Bible teaching, really for the rest of your life. This morning's Bible teaching is about Bible teaching. I want to begin with a question and you can raise your hand in answering yes to this question. It'll be interesting to see. Who present here has ever taught a Bible lesson to someone else. Go ahead and show me. I think a lot of you have. That's great. If you've ever taught the Bible, you know there are a couple of things that are important for a Bible lesson to really work. The first thing is, if you're the teacher, you have to know your material. You have to, have to, have to know what you're talking about. You have to know the content. But there's a second thing you have to know too, right? If the teaching is really going to bridge the gap and really going to help those who are hearing it, not only do you have to know the content, you also have to know the state of your listeners. What do they already know? What are they afraid of? What are they struggling with? Where should I start? What should I take extra time to defend and explain and counter-argue? You have to know your audience. So those two things at least, you have to know your material and you have to know the listeners to whom you're teaching. Have you ever had the misfortune of being taught by someone who obviously didn't know the material they were teaching? I have. And it I will confess to you, it's not just annoying to me, it's angering to me to have to sit through that. I just think there's no excuse for that. If you're a teacher, you have to know your material. There's no excuse to not know it. But have you ever had the misfortune of being taught by someone who, maybe they knew the material, but they had no clue where you were at and what you needed, and how you were reacting, and how you were responding. In other words, they were just uh, completely clueless about their listeners, their audience. That's also annoying. It tends to be boring, and it just doesn't get through. But in addition to those two things as a teacher, knowing your material and knowing to whom you're teaching, there's a third factor that could make teaching fall flat and accomplish nothing. 
And that third factor is actually what's talked about in our text this morning, Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. In Hebrews 5, the teacher, the one who's writing Hebrews, he knows his stuff. And he knows the audience. And yet still, he says his teaching isn't going to work and it's going to fall flat. This is the third reason why teaching can fail and fall flat. And it's that the students, the listeners, just don't care. They just refuse to listen. They're uninterested, unmotivated. He uses the word dull of hearing. This is the danger why Bible teaching doesn't get through. I'll show it to you here in the text. Our text is 11 through 14. Let's pick it up in verse 7. It says in Hebrews 5 verse 7, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now our text begins in verse 11, but just notice that in verses 7 through 10, it talks about Jesus being heard, and Jesus obeying. Because our text in verses 11 to 14 are about you hearing and you obeying. About this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So you see how this teacher says in verse 11, this teacher who knows his material and he knows his audience, he says in verse 11, I can't keep teaching you right now. If I tried to teach you what I want to teach you about Melchizedek, it would fall flat. And it's not because I don't know the material and it's not because I don't love and know you, but it's because you are uninterested. You're too dull, you're too lazy, you're too uncommitted. So he stops what he's doing and actually 5.11 all the way through chapter 6 to chapter 7 verse 1 is a parenthesis because if you see chapter 7 verse 1 he says and now this Melchizedek. He mentions Melchizedek verse 10 of chapter 5 then he picks it back up in verse 1 of chapter 7. So the entire, uh, th that entire span between those verses is a parenthesis or an aside but just because it's a parenthesis or an aside doesn't make it of secondary importance. In fact, in fact, this text is very important. I have learned a lot about my role as teach, teacher and about what the teaching ought to do. I've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks just from meditating on this text. It shows us a lot. It shows us that the teaching is for the benefit of those who hear. In other words, the teacher is about to talk about this great thing that he wants to talk about and he knows it and he's ready to talk about it. But he realizes, in 5 verse 11, he realizes, if, if I talk about this, my listeners aren't ready to hear it and they don't want to hear it. So this proves that Bible teaching is not just about someone getting up here and talking about how much knowledge they have. If that knowledge is not receivable by and helpful to those who are hearing it, then the teaching's not worth it. So he slows down, he changes course. Because it's all about connecting and helping the people who he's teaching. He's a good example to any Bible teacher here that your Bible teaching is not about you getting through your material. Your Bible teaching is about you getting through to the people. This is an example of very sensitive and aware pastoral care. This is actually a rebuke. He tells these people, you are, you're dull of hearing and you're hard-hearted. 
And it's a rebuke. But this is so, this is so important because too few of you know how to rebuke as an expression of concern and love. We all know how to let someone have it. We get fed up and we snap at them. But that rebuke is an expression of your annoyance or your temper. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not Christian rebuke. This text is a rebuke. But the Bible shows us that merciful, tender, others-focused love is actually demonstrated in speaking a hard word, but speaking that hard word, not harshly, but out of love. That's what this text provides for us. It is a wonderful example of the kind of pastor I ought to be. I'm not yet, but ought to be. I'm growing. This is a diagnosis of the hearts of the people to whom it's addressed. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, said to us that the word of God is living and active and it's sharper than any sword and it judges and divides right down between soul and spirit. And Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, is in practice what Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 said was true in principle. We actually see it in full color in practice here in 5, 11 to 14. And so this text will do two things. One, it'll help you individually. This is not just a text about some sort of knowledge somewhere. This will help you individually decide, one, are you benefiting from the Bible teaching you are receiving? And two, will you ever benefit from the Bible teaching you receive in the future? As an individual, this, this will determine that for you. But a second thing that this text does is it will help all of us together understand the role of Bible teaching and how it works and how it helps all of us together as a church. So this Bible teaching about Bible teaching is extraordinarily helpful individually and corporately. That's why it's worth looking at again. Even though we looked at it the last time I was in this pulpit a couple of weeks ago, I, I defined dull of hearing and said six or seven things about that. I'm not going to go back over that today. If you missed that, you can pick up that message on our website. But I want to I want to dive right back into it this morning in verses 11 and 12. It says, about this, we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you see that in the beginning of verse 12, by this time you ought to be teachers, instead you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. I find verse 12 remarkably unremarkable. There is an unremarkable expectation in verse 12. And the unremarkable expectation in verse 12 is that anybody in any of those seats who has been in that seat for longer than a year or so should be ready to be a teacher and even a leader in the church. Anybody? Yeah, anybody. Everybody? Yeah, everybody. That's what verse 12 says is that if you are receiving Bible teaching the way you're supposed to, then after receiving it, you are ready to teach it to somebody else. It sounds a whole lot like our mission and vision for ministry. Our mission and vision for ministry is not that we'll make disciples of Jesus. Our vision is very specific. Making and training disciples who make and train disciples of Jesus. That's what verse 12 is, is about. That if you're truly a follower of Jesus, you'll never be content just learning. You will only be content if you are both learning and sharing and bringing someone else along. Every individual within the church is expected to carry on this role of helping others to come to know Jesus. This doesn't mean that you have to wear a microphone or stand up in front of a classroom and be a teacher. But this does mean that whatever you've learned about Jesus, you should be actively, relationally bringing someone else along to enjoy those things too. They are too good to keep to yourself. And people are too important. Everybody's going to live forever in one place or the other. So you can't possibly keep the good news of the gospel stuck inside. You have to share it with somebody else. That's the, the, un, that's the remarkably unremarkable expectation that verse 12 gives us. So ready for a check. This is a question for me, for all of my fellow pastors, 
whether they drink coffee or hot chocolate, for all of my fellow elders, for everybody who leads our ABF ministries, for everybody who's, who, who, who's active in leadership in our youth ministry, this is the question. Can the people to whom you've been teaching, are they ready to bring someone else along in the Christian faith? If they aren't, then you're not accomplishing your job. Even if you get through your notes and teach your lesson, your job is to transfer that in such a human and passionate and loving way that now they want to help others the same way you have helped them to keep the whole thing going. And look at what it says in verse 13. In the end of verse 12, it talks about the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. And it says in verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. These expressions here, the elementary principles of God, the first oracles of God, the milk, in the context of, the context of Hebrews, this probably refers somewhat to the Old Testament shadows that are fulfilled in substance in Jesus. And maybe some of these original hearers of this didn't yet understand how Jesus Christ perfectly fulfilled the sacrificial system. And yet he says, there's an interesting word in verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. The ESV translation, at least here, has that unskilled in the word of righteousness. That's a very significant word in the text because unskilled means that this is talking about behavior, practice, conduct. In other words, it, it's, verse 13 isn't saying you don't know about the word of righteousness. Verse 13 is saying you are unskilled in walking in the way of righteousness. Big difference. And as we talk about Bible teaching, that's the difference that makes the difference. When he says they're unskilled in the word of righteousness, he doesn't mean that they have no idea about God's righteous standards. When he says they're unskilled in the word of righteousness, he means they have no personal plan of walking in God's righteousness. It's about the truth applied in life. He's not talking about ignorance. What he is talking about is indifference. They have heard it, but they haven't listened from a heart that cares. He's not talking about mental deficiency. He's addressing moral disinclination. It's not that they don't have the capacity in the brain. It's that they don't have the drive in the life. They haven't put into practice what they've been taught. They know what God's word says about righteousness, but they're not interested in walking uprightly like they should. The the issue in the context was persecution. The church was being persecuted, and so instead of staying in the way of righteousness with fidelity and courage and obedience, they were wandering and drifting and letting go of the righteousness of the gospel. The danger, to pick up the word from chapter 6, verse 12, look at this funny word in chapter 6, verse 12. It says, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The issue was sluggishness. They knew about God's righteousness, but they were sluggish in walking in it. The danger is a sluggish kind of letting go and drifting away from the gospel. You've heard it, but you're sluggish about how it really works in your life. So this is the question. This is the question I'm asking you individually. Are you sluggish about God's righteousness in your life? Are you sluggish and lazy about God's righteousness in your life? Or are you on point? Are you focused with a desire to know and walk in God's righteous ways in the gospel? 
Which one is it? Which one is it for you? And verse 14, verse 14 will show you exactly where you want to get to. The target is not foggy or murky or unclear. Verse 14 says, this is where you want to get to. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice, its, ap its application by constant practice, to distinguish good from evil. This is where you need to get to, to be a mature Christian who has your conduct and your conscience trained to do the right thing. This is where you need to get to, because immature babies don't have any discernment. Immature babies don't know how to choose right from wrong, so immature babies will therefore chew on anything that their hand can get to their mouth. This is why we have to lock up the, the Johnson cleaning products so they, don't, so they don't just shake that up and make it their own milkshake. They'll put anything in their mouth. Verse 14 says, this is, if you want to get past that stage, the teacher's telling them, think of, it's, it's kind of, just to put it personally, it's like, uh, it's like the pastor is frustrated with them. In a spirit-filled, loving kind of way, he's frustrated. Because he's saying, I've been knowing you for five years. I shouldn't have to protect you from the Drano. You should know by now that that's not a drink for you. Why, why, are, you, why are you so unresponsive that I still have to protect you as if you're a two-year-old when really you've been in the church for 12 years? Mature adults are presented with choices that require discernment. Look, this, this, is, this, is, this is obvious, I hope. Mature adults are presented with choices that require discernment. And if you are a mature adult when you're presented with that kind of choice, you can make the right choice. In other words, as much as I want to be your pastor and our elders want to shepherd you, every decision in your life, you shouldn't have to be paralyzed and call for backup. There should be 99 decisions that you know what to do about. And then maybe one of them comes along and it really is pretty tricky or complex and we're very happy to help you with that one. But only a baby needs help with every single step and every single decision. And the sanctified, God-honoring frustration in this text is that church members who have been around for a long time are still stuck at that level and it ain't right. It's like give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, but teach him to fish. Feed him for his lifetime. This is, this is the point of verse 14. So that's the question for you. This is the question for you. I'm asking this very directly. I want you to consider this individually. How invested are you in your own spiritual maturity? I have to answer the question how invested I am in your spiritual maturity. Believe it or not, I lose sleep over that. I do. That doesn't make me a great pastor. It makes me a, a, a biblically acceptable pastor. That's what God expects of me. But I'm not asking it. I'm asking you. How invested are you in your spiritual maturity? This is a great question to ask at the end of the year as you look back. It's a great question to ask at the beginning of the year as you look forward. In other words, spiritual maturity. Prove it. What choices are you making? What time are you spending? What relationships are you cultivating? What are you saying no to? And what are you saying yes to that proves to me that you are invested in your own spiritual maturity? Is there any evidence that you are invested in your own spiritual maturity? And what is that evidence? I ask that because some people never advance. I know people in this church, and I'm, I almost put my hands over my eyes because I'm talking about certain people in this church and I don't want to be looking at you when I say this because I'm not, I'm not thinking about you in particular, okay? <laughs> but <laughs> I know people in this church who have been in this church for 14 years who have made about four months worth of spiritual advancement 
And I know persons, I know you, women and men in this church who have been here for a year and a half, who have made 22 years of spiritual advancement. Same church, same teaching, same ABFs, but the question is, how are you invested in your own spiritual maturity? That's what this text is getting at, and we see this here in Hebrews 5, and my, what I, actually what I believe about biblical exposition is such that my style is usually, I, I don't turn the page a lot. I just drill into what's there. This morning, I want to make an exception to that and use a cross-reference because it is so helpful on these exact same themes. I want to turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Because this text shines a light on the exact same themes that we were in in Hebrews chapter 5. And just like Hebrews 5, Ephesians 4 will be very challenging for you individually. And Ephesians 4 will be extremely helpful for us globally as a church as we evaluate who we are and who we're becoming. So look with me at Hebrews 4. We'll pick it up in verse 11. And he being the ascended Christ, and the ascended Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints. This is the reason that they're here. Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Then here's the goal in verse 13. This is the goal. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here's what we want to avoid. Verse 14. So that we won't be, so that we won't any longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Then he comes back around in verses 15 and 16 and shows us how it's supposed to work. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by what every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that the body builds itself up in love. This text has all the same themes, pretty much, that Hebrews 5 did, and it's a very helpful text. I just want to give you three points out of this text. That these are three evidences of spiritual maturity, and they come right out of the text. Here are the three. Christ-likeness, constancy, and cooperation. Christ-likeness, constancy and cooperation the first one is Christ-likeness that is conforming my conduct and my character to the conduct and character of Christ the second is constancy and by that I mean a constant commitment to sound doctrine I'm not swayed here and swayed there I have discernment and I'm constantly committed to sound doctrine and the third one is cooperation with the body of Christ the whole body of Christ grows together as each member speaks the truth in love one to another I mean you you see these in the text verse 13 is Christ likeness verse 13 says until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ Christ likeness and then constancy to sound doctrine is right there in verse 14 it says so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes and then spiritual cooperation is there in verses 15 and 16 verse 15 says speaking the truth in love is not just something the apostles do it's what every member of the body does and then verse 16 actually says the whole body will only grow when every individual member of the body provides the truth and the love to every other member of the body so the whole thing grows mutually through the community through cooperation so these three points are not just sort of nebulously in the bible somewhere These Christ-likeness, constancy, and cooperation are meant to be individual check marks for you to consider. 
Am I advancing in Christ-likeness or not? Am I holding constant to sound doctrine or am I drifting? And am I cooperating with the body of Christ actively or am I not? These are things for you to ask yourself. Because look at the flip side. The immature, the immature baby, not yet growing Christian is not becoming Christ-like, but rather is becoming less and less like Christ. The immature, carnal, not growing Christian is choosing sin over Christ. And when temptation comes, she or he just goes the way of the flesh, which is the opposite of the way of Christ. And the immature church member is not constant in understanding sound doctrine, but instead is tossed about by every wind and, and, and every the, this new thing and that new thing, and they're always just sort of flighty and going around from one thing to the other. And the immature, not growing Christian, isn't growing in cooperation. Instead, it's the opposite. It's the immature Christian that is the cause of disunity, factions, pride, selfishness in the church. The whole church is supposed to grow together and we're supposed to help each other grow. But the immature member actually drags other members down with them. These are the markers and the measures of our growth. Where are you at? And as we grow, let's not forget, we always, always want babies around here. I want babies' babies in the nursery. And I also want, need spiritual babies in the church. It's all about church growth, not because good, mature Christians leave one church and go to another one, but because new Christians, new disciples are formed through evangelism, through relationship, through love. We always want new babies in the church. This month, this is the month to invite somebody to church. We printed out those cards. There are plenty of extras out there on the desk and you uh, take those, your workplace, school, whatever it is, and, and invite people to come. We want new believers in the church all the time. But as babies enter into the church, we want lots and lots of babies, but we don't want them to remain a baby over the course of the years. And this is actually, I mean, this is one place among others where I could, I could very openly tell you, you should keep your elders and pastors accountable to do this. You, you, you should be on our case to do this because this is what the Bible says we have to do. And if we're not doing this, we are not exercising what God has authorized us to do as an elder board, as a pastoral team, and, and uh, you know, if it goes on long enough, we should be removed from that office. Th- this gives you not some weird way of evaluating us like, he said hi to me or he didn't, or he remembered my birthday or he didn't. This gives you a biblical way of evaluating us. And it, it's this, look at the result of our shepherding and the result of our teaching. And you ought to be able to see people who were not a whole lot like Christ, but who are progressively becoming more like Christ. And if you see many people under my influence, and they are making unchristlike choices, and I'm doing nothing to correct them or rebuke them, then I'm failing at what God's called me to do here. The second one, constancy. Not being tossed to and fro. If the leadership of this church is tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine or the people who are sitting under the teaching of this church become less constant in their commitment to sound doctrine, then there's a failure. And the third one, that's spiritual cooperation. It's the role of the pastors and elders to protect the unity of the body of Christ. And if we refuse to protect the unity and help the members get along with one another, then we're failing at our calling. Now, it's it's always a judgment call because another thing, maybe I'm getting too far into it here, another thing that Ephesians 4 says is that if all the pastor or elder does is chase around immature baby Christians and try to correct them, then 
then there, there's no leadership development. So there's always a judgment call. We want to be willing to leave the 99 and go after the one, but you don't want an elder team and a pastoral staff that just spends all their time with uh, cranky, self-centered, you know, carnal people. You want, you want them to invest in the next generation and those who are teachable and bring the whole thing along. So there's a whole lot to look at here, but it's a, a place for you to hold us accountable to what we're called to do. And it's a place where you are called to much as well because every member of the body contributes to this. As we move into, as we move into 2018 and actually the population of our city and our county uh, surges with all the development that's happening, this is certainly an opportunity for the church to grow. But will the church grow? Is the church ready to grow? I could, I could easily envision us growing by 100, 200, 400, 500 members in 2018, 2019, 2020. But are we ready for that? You see, if this church is filled with persons who are Christ-like who are constant in spiritual doctrine, and who are cooperating with one another in unity, then I say, bring it on. 600 new members isn't enough. We want to grow more than that. But if we aren't filled with members who are Christ-like, who are constant in their commitment to spiritual sound doctrine, and who are, who are unified, then we're, we're not ready to grow by 50 new members. This, this is the marker of our being positioned to grow. So we look at that together. And from, he, from uh, Ephesians 4, come back with me to Hebrews 5 as we move toward conclusion. The question Hebrews 5 is asking is, are you listening? Are you hearing with a soft heart? Are you ready to grow? And Hebrews 5 is, is a warning. The first warning in Hebrews was in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1 where it said, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. And the second warning in Hebrews was in chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And the third warning in Hebrews is right here in chapter 5, verse 11. And verse 12, where it says, don't be dull of hearing, but move on in growth. And this, this is the question, and, 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 and I want you to consider it individually. And I want us to look at it together corporately. I've, I had a great opportunity, personally, to evaluate this in my life last week because I was away at family reunion. So I'm with my dad, both of my sons and my son-in-law, who's like a son to me, and my daughter. And I'm looking at the generation ahead of me. And I'm looking at the generation behind me. Our daughter is pregnant with what will be our first grandchild. I'm thinking about that generation. As I'm looking ahead at my dad, I'm looking backwards at my sons, my son-in-law. The person I looked at the most was me. How am I investing in my spiritual advancement? Specifically, where am I at? What am I doing? As I grow older and I'm at this longer, I desperately want to actually become more nimble. I don't want to get stuck. I don't want to get just so steady at what I'm doing that I don't think about a course correction. I want to stay right on, on my tiptoes, ready to move where God wants me to move. I want to get softer relationally the older I get. You know, it's sad, but there are some people who have being in the church a long time equals getting burned by church people time after time after time so they become more relationally closed the longer they're in the church it's a tragedy I want to become more vulnerable and more relationally open the longer I'm 
resident within the same Christian family and the same Christian church. Where is it with you? Where is it with you? I want to tell you the reason this text is important is because guess what comes after Hebrews 5? This is not a trick question. Hebrews chapter 6. And Hebrews chapter 6 is a very direct warning about spiritual apostasy. 5, 11 to 14 is about advancing in spiritual maturity. 6, 1 through 12 is about becoming a spiritual apostate. So I put those two together to simply come to this conclusion. To remain in spiritual immaturity is not a safe, neutral state. To remain in spiritual immaturity is to advance toward gospel apostasy. That's what this is saying. It's saying it's this important that every one of you is accountable to advance in spiritual maturity for this reason so that you don't revert to spiritual apostasy. But there's no standing still. How could we stand still? Jesus is too awesome and beautiful to stand still in front of. I want to run toward him. And the truth of the gospel is too powerful to stand still with it. Every one of you must pursue spiritual maturity in order to avoid spiritual apostasy. So listen, listen with a soft heart to the word of God. Are you listening? I plead with you to listen because if you will listen to the word of God, what you are hearing, if you'll listen, is you are hearing the love of God manifest in the gospel. If you will listen, you'll live. Let's pray. Father, hear your children as they pray. As we pray in the name of Jesus, as we pray by the power of the Spirit. Father, hear your children as they pray. And Father, we pray for ourselves. May we grow. Show us, Holy Spirit, how to advance in spiritual maturity. Hear your children as they ask this and show us, show us today what we have to say no to. Show us today what we have to say yes to in order to advance in spiritual maturity. Father, hear your children as they pray. And we have another prayer request, Lord. This we lift up to you in faith. Oh, Father, bring back the wandering. Too many, God, way too many, have been present here. Kids who have come up through our youth ministry who are now adults. And they're not pursuing Christ. God, bring them back, save them, convert them, rescue them. God, bring back those who have wandered into spiritual apostasy. Father, hear your children as they pray and save us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bless Fill your heart with his love for you. Church, may the Lord give you ears to hear. May the Lord give you a conscience and a will that is soft and pliable to the voice of his spirit. And may the Lord himself so glorify his name in you. Amen.